Uh, Mercedes Pedra serves as the Director of Multicultural Education for the Office for Health, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UC Davis Health. She was, is responsible for managing and monitoring diversity and inclusion educational resources within UC Davis Health and UC Davis pertaining to equity, diversity, and inclusion education. She is a program director of the TPMG uh, UC Davis Health Physicians Pathway Initiative an educational uh, initiative that will help build the next generation of physicians to advance Latino health. Mercedes has her master's of science degree in counseling education, focusing on workforce development and organizational management from Sacramento State University. She championed, championed nationally recognized academic and research programs to increase historically underrepresented students, staff, faculty at all levels of California's higher education in the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. We are honored to have Mercedes here today to share the work she's done with Prep Medico. Welcome, Mercedes. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you so much to um, CBNA and all of our uh, supporters uh, for this fabulous conference. I've had such a great time from the beginning plenary to all the breakouts, um, learning as I'm going at the same time because I'm a lifelong learner. So thank you for having me. Um, as Aaron lifted up, um, the work that I do is to help diversify our workforce. As we all listen to Dr. Perry Ackerman Barger this morning and all of our other guests, the need to have more diverse individuals in our healthcare field is critical. If anything, the pandemic has shown us that there aren't enough of us in the field and really to be able to take care of our growing population of Native American, Latinx, African-American, Black communities, we need each and every one of you in the healthcare field. And today we're focusing on nursing. Um, I'm gonna share our pathway program that is um, quite extensive. We started it in 2016. It's a partnership with uh, UC Davis School of Medicine and the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group. Uh, the two got together in 2015 to talk about how to best uh, diversify our workforce and the birth of what we call Budet Medical uh, was birthed in 2016. Uh, Kaiser Permanente had funded this uh, for us to be able to provide a comprehensive, supportive program for our students to really understand how to navigate the educational world into the health professions, the health profession field, if you get into the field, and every aspect of our lives. So Prep Medico works holistically with our students and gets them where they need to be. Since 2016, it has been quite a ride. Our um, pipeline program is uh, the largest in the region and it only focuses in the Northern and Central Valley of California. My partner in crime in this work is my program uh, coordinator and Victoria is gonna introduce herself. When she unmutes. <laughs> How about that? I'm, I'm bringing it in. I'm sorry. Okay. Hi, folks. Uh, so my name is Victoria. I am one of the program coordinators for Prep Medico. Um, uh, and my colleague, Mercedes, is truly our leader leading uh, the Prep Medico program. We just finished our most recent cohort, um, which we did entirely virtual uh, this past summer. Um, and our program is really an incredible resource for students who know that they are interested in the health professions, but are really looking for additional support and guidance to uh, get them into their schools of choice. Thank you, Victoria. And so what the research shows in diversifying our pipeline program is we have to get to students earlier and earlier and earlier. My hope and my wish is to be able to start from elementary school, middle school, high school, and beyond to get our students into the healthcare field, specifically in nursing. So, but to do so, they only have so much funding. So we get the students in their freshman and sophomore years of college. So we we like to show our program now for our high school attendees so that they better understand what type of programs are there to support them in this trajectory. So I'm going to share my screen. 
just a second here. And let's just do one show. Okay, everyone can see my screen? Yes, okay, very good. So just wanting to put forth, this is uh, UC Davis Health. It's in Sacramento, California, here in Northern California. So let's go with our logo. Um, going back, um, Prep Medico is short for uh, Preparando Estudiantes para Sed Medicos in Spanish. So Kaiser Permanente reached out to UC Davis because of the need of the current uh, the current uh, population in California is nearly 40% Latino, but barely 5% of the workforce for physicians are Latino. So that does not work well in eradicating the health disparities and equities that uh, Dr. Ackerman Barger shared with us today. So we seek to build the next generation of physicians and healthcare providers and nurses. Product Medical really uh, reaches broadly to be able to touch all of those uh, professions that students have interested in. So we're looking for students who are committed to serving and advancing the health of Latinx and other underserved communities because here in California, we're nearly 40%. So our initiative is expansive, um, it's comprehensive, and it's also longitudinal. Although the first component we uh, offer to our freshman and sophomore college students, we have additional programming for juniors and seniors that we're going to outline in their undergraduate education. This is one of our touch points. Uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, this is an in-person program. And so these are our students with our NSMSA uh, students and LMSA student groups, which are student groups within the School of Medicine. Um, our medical students and uh, nursing students uh, are able to foster and mentor our students through their educational trajectory. So our pathway, our pipeline into medical school and to the schools of health, we have navigating your path into medicine. Once again, that's for our college freshmen and sophomores. Then we bring students back for the following summer to start looking into research and internship opportunities that they get to do either in the community and with UC Davis Health. Now, for our students who are interested in medicine to become a doctor, they have to take what's known as the MCAT exam. So we prepare scholarships um, at the end of students' junior and senior year to be able to complete that um, exam and get the best score possible because it's competitive to get into medical school, nursing school, all the health professions. Then once in medical school, you're able to come back and mentor this college and uh, freshmen and sophomores and everybody else in this pathway. So as I had mentioned, our Latinx population make up 30% of the population here in California. So that's approximately 16 million Latinx people. So the whole workforce of physicians in California are at 61,000 physicians, but only 5% of those are Latinx. So that's about 3,000 Latinx physicians to minister medical services to those 16 million. Okay, this is just a little information, the research showing where in California the population of Latinx are. And so on the right side, you see the California Latino power map and the darker um, areas are have the largest density of Latinx students, uh, Latinx populations. So, the first component of this pathway program is navigating your path into medicine. So some of those highlights are what does Prep Medico do? Well, we offer quite a few in a six week program, lectures and workshops, simulations, as you saw in some of other PowerPoints, we have clinical simulations and a lot of mentorship. So we're gonna highlight some of that for you now. 
So in that six week intensive, and for the last year in 2020 and this year, it was all virtual. Um, we had a four week program instead and moving forward, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have a hybrid program. Out of the six weeks, three weeks will be online and the remainder of the three weeks you will be in person here as our students are and rotating um, at different campuses for Kaiser Permanente here in Northern California and UC Davis. So we talk to students in the classroom environment of everything that they need to strengthen themselves academically, professionally, scientifically, holistically. So by providing those, all of that information, it builds the students' confidence and academic skills and they have better uh, navigating skills uh, by the end of our program to be able to take on leadership roles and continue on into the healthcare workforce. So some of those lectures and workshops are outlined here. Navigating your path into medicine, the classes students will take are key scientific concepts, learning skills, how do we learn Perry Ackman Barger, um, talked about that also. How do I learn? What's the best time of day for us to learn? What's my time management skills? So those professional development skills um, are a highlight. Leadership skills, it is very heavy in leadership to develop our students to become the future leaders in healthcare. We talk about what's the need in professionalism, and then the broader perspective occurs not only in medicine, but in nursing, public health, um, and even in technology because UC Davis also um, offers health informatics. So to do so, we have clinical immersion, immersion opportunities for our students. So our students, and there's a picture of our cohort from 2019, have quite a few opportunities. There are 45 students in every cohort, and so those clinical rotations at Kaiser and at UC Davis can be anywhere from OBGYN, can be in pediatrics, radiology, neuroscience, you name it, the students will have rotations there twice a week within those six weeks. Our nurses at UC Davis are amazing and every year they take each and every one of these students into their areas of special specialization and they have shown up consistently to be uh, mentors and have the students shadow them in the variety of arenas that our nurses work in. Simulations are extremely important, and this is where in the simulation lab, if you were here with uh, Dr. Perryman Ackman Barger's uh, presentation, she showed uh, her in, in the simulation suite with other students. Well, we put students through the same. They'll have simulations in labor and delivery, um, in a variety of other simulations. In addition to, our students walk away with a few certificates of completion. Um, they will walk away with their uh, CPR certificate. This year, we were able to provide certification in mental health because of the challenges with the COVID pandemic and how it impacts everyone. Our students now have certification in mental health. Community engagement is where our students are able to go to student-run clinics. UC Davis has quite a few of them. And so the healthcare system is very vast and we want our students to have every touch point possible, not just in the hospital, because what we know in the future, health doesn't happen in the hospital, it really happens in the community. So the students rotate at community clinics, specifically at Clinica Tabati on the weekends. Then they're learning about health disparities, the social determinants of health. Those are the environmental factors that impact our populations. And then what's going on in health policy? As, uh, as students who are interested in nursing, nursing has so much flexibility. In some of the breakout sessions, we've seen nurses who are business leaders. We've seen them in entrepreneurship. We see nurses leading in government, specifically in health policy. So the uh, field of nursing has so much flexibility that the impact that our students can have and the leadership skills that they develop throughout their education will touch every aspect of of an individual's life. Some of the testimonials here of what our students have experienced through going through their sixth week program. Once again, here's a few uh, photos of the students um, and they're able to build uh, 
great long-term relationships with their cohort. So what's important about this is they're building their own community to get through school, to get through those successes and those challenges that we all know that come up in life. But also as they embark into nursing school or medical school or public health, that they always have that touch point and support from not only the professionals in Budapest Medical and the School of Nursing and the hospitals, uh, but that they have their own internal support system that they can help ride out their life together. So I'm just gonna turn over to Victoria and she uh, give a little input of what she's experienced with the students. Yeah, so I've now gone through two cohorts of students and every time I am just amazed at how motivated, enthusiastic um, and incredible all of the students that enter into our program are. And they leave the program with such an empowered sense of self-confidence. You can see that they have a much clearer vision of what they wanna do with their lives and a much clearer understanding of who they are and what they're passionate about and how they can use their lived experiences to help uh, their own community in whatever health profession they decide to pursue, whether it is medicine or whether they were inspired by one of the nurses who talked um, on a panel um, and they realized that it was really the field of nursing that, that was for them. And so we really try to expose our scholars to all the different pathways um, in the field of healthcare to really uh, make sure that our students know all the abundance of opportunities that are available to them. Thanks, Victoria. So really being able to demystify this whole pathway into the health professions um, has just had our students into leadership that beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, we have had students in all levels of professional schools um, across the nation, not specifically here in California. Um, so what we can offer is definitely a holistic perspective in working with our students. And what I like to offer is we focus on um, healing centered education for our students in all those holistic components that we just lifted up. So here's some simulations in labor and delivery, blood pressure simulations so that they have some clinical experience. In addition to, um, our students will work with migrant farm working families um, in the Northern Central Valley. So with Kaiser Permanente's help, they have specific educational opportunities and centers for our migrant farm workers. Many of our students are bilingual. And so they go in as community and health education specialists. We train them at the front part of the program. So toward the end that they're able to uh, give more information to the health, the farm workers and look at their needs and holistic health. That's the applied knowledge component that Prep Medico offers and getting students to understand their impact in our communities. Definitely leadership is a huge component of Prep Medico. So we go through quite a few uh, assessment tools to find out what our strengths are. First and foremost, as leaders, we have to know who we are first and foremost. And we have them, we have tons of strengths and we have some weaknesses too, but at least we're able to look at them, recognize them. So we start with uh, strength finders. We do professional development assessments. We do personality assessments. Uh, we get quite a few assessments. So the student walks away with a better understanding of their values, their strengths, and what they bring to the table moving forward as leaders. Okay, some of the lectures here, we have the team on the left, that is our emergency medicine team, Dr. Kara Tolls and Dr. Uh, Tiffany Johnson are outstanding uh, healthcare providers. Um, they are also researchers and do quite a bit of publication in pediatric uh, uh, areas that uh, we need to lift up around racism in pediatrics and all of healthcare. We have our uh, preceptors, Dr. Luis Godoy, uh, his 
beautiful presence and mentorship of our students is extremely, extremely uh, beneficial. He himself tells his lived experience as being a father, a teenage father at the age of, I believe, 16 or 17 years of age, and his whole trajectory of going to school at the community college, getting his grades and what he needed to transfer from transfer into um, his, his trajectory into medicine. And now he is, works as a surgeon in cardiology. Very impactful and powerful. So once again, the lifelong relationships, uh, we touch base with our students every single year to find out how they're doing, what their needs are. Victoria, myself, and a few other uh, staff members will reach out and survey our students to find out where they're at and where their need, needs are. And so that we're having that longitudinal aspect of all the work that we do. So, some of the scholars, uh, we have residencies, demographic and community college transfer rates that we wanna just uh, highlight quickly. So this just shows where our students are from. The majority of them do come from Cal the Northern California area and uh, Central Valley, as you see um, in 2018 and 2019. Also, uh, some of the race and ethnicity demographics. One interesting trend after 2016 is we have more females than males in our application pool. We have done quite extensive outreach to try to uh, increase the male population into the health professions. We're working with our collaborators at community uh, organizations for young uh, men of color to let them know that uh, the health Healthcare field is a viable uh, career choice for them. And so here we have uh, just the gender in 2018 with female being 71, 2018 uh, being 62% female, and that was the same for 2020. Our community college transfer rate. So 50% of our students come from the community colleges because that's where our students, our black and brown students of color have the uh, biggest influx is at the community college. So we were interested in our cohorts to date to where uh, they are with their transfer rates. We're showing California transfer rates from the community college as a whole statewide, and then our national transfer rates of community college students at 33%, California is 31%, transfer rates for our students in Pudup Medical are 81.5%. We're talking about the freshman and sophomore students. Now we're getting into the junior and senior undergraduate students and the opportunities that we are able to provide for them. So we've partnered with the centers of uh, the centers of uh, the CDC, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, in addition to the Mind Institute, to have our students be able to apply into uh, the maternal child health initiative for student advancement undergraduate programs. This too is another program that our junior and senior students from Product Medical and from the Northern Central Valley of California are able to work with our, our researchers and our community members to get, a, uh, get public health research focus in the area of specialization that the mind focuses on, which is neurodevelopmental disability. Abilities. Many of our students through their whole trajectory of healthcare fields, whether it be nursing or, or doctors or physicians assistants, don't get the exposure that we would hope that they could get in working with uh, kids with disabilities. So we partnered with the Mind Institute to be able to really give that new perspective and also being able to get our students uh, perspective and how to better serve our students with neurodevelopmental disabilities and specifically our black and brown students with neurodevelopmental disabilities. So some work that uh, they're able to do in the community. This is one poster presentation. We were able to place some students uh, in the community to uh, look at black infant mortality and stress um, on the mother and the child. And so that uh, was very significant for um, our work 
at the health system, but also for the state of California, because our students are able to produce their research and then they go to the centers of disease control um, and prevention in Georgia and they're able to present their research there. So we also partnered with our pathology department, and this is where students get to do lab research. Um, it's an eight week program called Hugh Edmondson, and they're able to uh, do some really amazing, amazing work um, on programs and research in pathology. So in terms of 10 shadowing activities with um, cryopathology, hemopathology, surgical pathology, and some of the work that is not cool to me because I'm not a scientist, but you know, they need to work with brains. And so the students get to work with brains and every path and process with that organ, um, they get to hold on to it, look at it with microscopes and every other aspect of pathology. So just some of the projects that our students um, have worked with, with their mentors, um, anything from cancer uh, and also machine learning, uh, which is really big in the healthcare field. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Victoria to talk about uh, the eligibility of getting into Prep Medigo. So for Prep Medigo, we are looking for first and second year students at four year schools. So whether that be state schools um, or private universities or public universities um, or community college students. Um, regardless of how many years you have been at the community college. Um, we're looking for people who are from the Central Valley or Northern California. And we do have some course requirements as well. So you must complete one quarter or semester of English and one quarter or semester of either general chem or general biology. And these courses just need to be completed prior to the start of the program, which would be next summer. Um, and then we do have a GPA requirement as well, 2.85 or higher. I would like to note that we do take a holistic review of our applications. So if you know students who may be interested, but they are wary of this GPA requirement, we would still encourage them to apply to our program. Um, we accept different citizenship statuses as well. Um, and we ask that our students have a demonstrated interest in becoming a physician uh, and working with underserved communities, whether that be tutoring, community service, um, you know, experiences on their resume that really show that they have a dedication to uh, working with uh, underserved communities and working in the healthcare uh, sector. Uh, so our next application cycle will open up on December 1st of this year, so in just a couple of months. Um, and there are a few things that we ask students to submit as part of this application. So they submit a one page resume, their transcript, uh, their financial aid award letter, only one letter of recommendation is required. And then uh, when we do have the in-person part of the program, we ask them to uh, get some mandatory health immunizations just to keep everyone safe. And so just looking at the immunizations, it's, in, it's critically important that our students have their immunizations up to date. Um, there's no way that a student can rotate at any hospital setting, whether it be Kaiser or uh, UC Davis Medical Center without their immunizations. What we don't have here is a COVID vaccine and we're updating that information as we are moving forward. Okay, so what we like to do is have webinars also available uh, for our students and we send that out to the listserv. And so we'll be able to send out our next uh, webinar uh, as we embark on the application process that opens up in December. We'll send that out to Capital City Nurses so that everyone that is at this conference can attend that webinar so that we can go step-by-step step through the application process and answer any questions that anyone has. Okay. This is our contact information here. Um, we are responsive to email and every other touch point that we could possibly work with our students. Uh, Victoria does quite a bit of our outreach. And so Victoria, do you wanna talk about our outreach really quickly? So we'll reach out to uh, programs at community colleges. So Mesa, Puente, um, 
organizations like that and we'll do presentations to their cohorts. We also do presentations at various community colleges and uh, UC schools as well as pre health organizations um, and during those presentations. Uh, we go through our application process, we can answer questions about who would be a great fit for our program and a little bit more about what our program has to offer for students. Um, and so if you would like to schedule a presentation for a group of students, please feel free to contact us via email or social media. Mm -hmm. And so um, as we're embarking on this, this specific pathway program, there are other pathway programs at our sister campuses, like UC San Francisco. Um, Stanford University has a wonderful program for community college students. Um, also UC Merced is embarking into the pathway programs. And so there are quite a few just in the Northern Valley, um, but looking across the nation, students such as yourself have the opportunity to go to John Hopkins University and go ahead and apply to their programs. But what you're looking for are pathway opportunities that one, do not cost you anything. But at Medical, our students do not pay anything. Uh, we pay for the in-person program, we pay for transportation. They are housed at Sacramento State University, so we pay for the housing. And then students get a small stipend at the end of the six week program. Um, our Rise Up program with the Mind Institute and the CDC is a more substantial funding. Um, and any junior and senior can apply to the Hugh Edmondson program and the Rise Up program, as long as they're, uh, they have all the requirements needed, which are similar to prep medicals. So this helps in your trajectory to de demystify how to get into the healthcare profession. Definitely being able to have those mentorships with wonderful nurses that we've had on these panels from a variety of different schools and different campuses and just wanting to let you know that there is support out there for each and every one of you. So we'll open it up to questions if anyone has any or maybe Erin has some questions for the program. We'll give it just a few minutes for any questions that anyone may have on the program. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or uh, type in the chat. Mm -hmm. And Victoria will put in the website link and any other supporting documentation that we can give you. I know we're running a little over, Erin, so we just want oh, to be mindful fine. of time. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we haven't had any questions. So okay. We'll move forward. So thank you so much, Mercedes and Victoria. Um, this is an amazing work that you two do. do. Um, I had the opportunity to present um, at the during the last cohort of students, and it was such an engaging experience. Um, your work is just so important. Um, so please show some love uh, to Victoria and Miss Mercedes in the chat. Um, also, um, please um, take the time to um, add them on Instagram. I think is what you plugged in there, Victoria. The pre at Prep Medico. Um, and while you're at it, you can also follow uh, CCBNA and uh, Sacramento Non. We both have Instagrams and Facebooks. Mm -hmm. um, so I would now like to take the time to introduce our next presenter, um, Dr. Jan Murray Garcia. She is a pediatrician and associate health science clinical professor at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing um, at UC Davis. She also serves as the director for social justice and immersive learning for the UC Davis health system. During her time at UC Davis, Dr. Murray Garcia has developed several programs around health equity and anti-racism issues, including the Interprofessional Central Valley Road Trip, the Summer Institute on Race and Health, and the Anti-Racism and Cultural Humility, also known as ARC, training program for nurse leaders. The ARC training program is currently uh, equipping UC Davis health system nurses, nurse leaders, and faculty to achieve anti-racism and um, equity goals in both inpatient care and in the, in the nursing workforce. She received her BA in human biology with honors and with uh, distinction from UC Davis, or from, Sta uh, excuse me, Stanford University. Her MD from UCSF um, and completed pediatric residency training at Oakland Children's Hospital followed by her uh, master's in public health from UC uh, Berkeley. With, um, 
Well, sorry, excuse me. With Melanie uh, Tavlon, she co excuse me, sorry, she co-founded and is writing a textbook on concept of cultural humility, which they distinguish from cultural competence, competency. She is widely published in health sciences, uh, sciences and literature. She remains in love with her husband of nearly 29 years, Professor Jorge Garcia, who is a UC Davis uh, new associate dean for diverse and inclusive learning communities. Um, she says to be aware, to be careful with those that you study with in nursing and medical school. The other loves of her life include her two adult children. And as they say, Blacksicans are the going to save the world. I had the opportunity to share three semester or three quarters with Dr. Um, Murray Garcia, who I refer to as Dr. Jan um, at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Jan as our guest speaker for the Breaking Down Barriers Conference. Thank you, Aaron. I'm gonna be quick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a great time already hearing about um, um, nursing as a career and all the ways to get into it. I, I myself am a pediatrician, as you heard, but I've spent the last decade at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing learning a lot about the profession. Um, I just encourage you to really um, think about uh, nursing as a profession very seriously, especially those of you who by default think you might want to go to medical school, really look beyond that. If you want to be a physician, I think that's great, but nursing is, is a pretty amazing career. Just quickly, the distinctions for, for me, um, <clears throat> a shorter time before you're seeing patients, you're going to actually see patients uh, and care for them. As, as nurses and, and physicians often, especially in an inpatient setting, don't get to spend very much time with their patients. You can also switch specialties. So I'm a pediatrician. If I wanted to be to treat um, neurology patients or emergency room patients, I would have to go through those residencies again. And that's not true in, in the nursing profession. Uh, the profession of physicianhood is not the most trusted profession. That's nursing. And it's been that way for years and years and years. So, um, and the reason I became a pediatrician is is because I love kids and uh, it was a way to do social justice and to live my values. And you can certainly do that as a nurse administrator, nurse educator, nurse professor, public health nurse, et cetera. So, um, our, uh, you know we need black and brown nurses. I, I hope you all know that, um, not just for the patient patient interactions, but for the um, colleagues, for your colleagues who aren't black and brown, but who serve black and brown patients, um, uh, teaching them as they grow, um, as you work with them, um, and also just professors of nursing who are black and brown are just, just not enough y'all. And, and that parallels um, medicine as well. Um, all right, I wanna, I can share my uh, screen um, or my, here it is. Let me, mm -mm 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 -mm. Do this. Should come up in just a second. Do y'all see that? Do you all see that the slides there? Yes. Okay. Don't know why that wasn't on the first one. So um I'm sorry, I butted in on this conference when I heard that there is a conference for um, black and brown folk considering nursing. I was like, I wanna come, I wanna come. Uh, Cause I've um, spent a lot of time thinking about some of the adversity between our communities, some of the conflict, some of the tension. And I don't know that I've ever been able to talk about it um, in a forum like this. So. I just really congratulate y'all for putting this together, Hispanic Nurse Association and, and, and uh, Capital City Black Nurses Association. We really need to lift each other up um, more so now than ever. 
So I'm gonna talk about the legacy of solidarity very quickly between black and brown folks. Um, uh, let me begin with some dedications and also full disclosure. I am married to a Mexican American. Um, so we, we really talking about black and brown solidarity y'all today, okay? And we have two offspring, um, my 24 year old daughter Canela Carolina and my um, uh, 20 year old son, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Guadalupe. And they have this saying that Blacksicans are gonna save the world. So that, that's where this time comes from, raising them to be fully present in, in both of the amazing traditions of peoples that run through their blood, but also listening to um, people talk about, um, let, let me show you, people talk about, um, my daughter used to say, mom, the Mexicans at Davis High don't like the Blacks. And uh, I first heard that in 2008, but had a sense of it, obviously growing up in California and being raised in East San Jose. But really quickly, we're gonna talk about scripts. Um, we hold for one another, for ourselves, for those people, for those black people, for those Hispanics, for those black and Latinos together, thinking that if we can see the scripts, we can confront them, interrupt them and potentially transform them. Um, and then um, as part of this, define horizontal and vertical violence as scripts that we get caught in, we don't often always see. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time messing each other up because uh, we don't see them as scripts that we can interrupt and that other people oftentimes have laying on us. Um, and uh, just get a sense of where are these scripts from and how do we interrupt them? So again, and, um, in Obama's first election, um, there was a lot of talk about how Latinos wouldn't vote for a black man. Hispanic voters wouldn't vote for a black man. And I thought, wow, that's weird. I married a Mexican. That doesn't sound right. Um, and my daughter said, oh, no, mom. She was at uh, Davis High or the junior high school here in Davis, California. She said, mom, the Mexicans don't like the blacks and the blacks don't like the Mexicans. And having grown up in East San Jose at a much less contentious time, I get it. We all have stereotypes about the other groups, but I'm like, really, Camila? Even when you're with each other on a campus, she goes, oh yeah, mom. And I came to teach her that that's a script, Canela, that's a script that doesn't have to exist, that we don't have to perform, if that makes sense. And, and um, we need to think about who that script is benefiting. In the case of Obama's election, who would that help if Hispanics or Latinos were not gonna vote for a black president, which I didn't think was true. So uh, the notion of, of scripts for me is like, it explains why we can't find a racist and yet we continue to have all these racialized outcomes like um, intergenerational inequality, even though everybody wants equality, um, at least before 2016, um, still uh, your children will live in a very uh, racially unequal world. Why is that when we all want, when many of us, most of us want this not to be the case? Um, so I started to think about scripts as um, an analogy that was helpful for me, scripts being found in television, movies, um, theater, and scripts being used, you know, the purposes of a script, if you think about that really quickly, usually I go through this a lot, lot less quickly, but um, you use them to, so the characters know what to say, what to wear, their relationships with other people, where they live, what their backstories are, um, uh, what they're gonna do, um, their relationships with other people, the power relationships. Does that, does that sound about right? And I came to realize that for me in my work, the most important aspect of a script is that the outcome is always the same. So you don't start out with one story and then you don't start out with the Twilight Saga and end up with the Game of Thrones or something like that, right? Um, that's another lecture for another time. But um, yeah, so the outcome is always the same. And if we keep having racialized outcomes, unequal outcomes, and we don't want to, 
We need to think that there's a script that all of us are performing, whether we realize it or not, and try and get better at identifying and then interrupting those scripts. So this is just one that Dita Canela told me about. Um, this is um, a pyramid in Mexico. And uh, she said, hey, mom, how come when, um, when the white folks do something amazing, like build the Hoover Dam, which we had just visited, you know, they kind of uh, award themselves and, and um, congratulate themselves. The Hoover Dam got the 20th century's greatest architectural feat. And, and she says, but when we do something, it's because aliens came from outer space, right? So it's just like, Genius could not exist in black and brown bodies. And those are the kind of scripts that we live with and that we believed about each other's groups too, right? So we have a script about in our society, which people give and which people take, right? We have a script about who's capable of creating great works of genius and which people are just simply waiting for those other people to create right? It often doesn't include Black and Latin people, and which people serve and which people are served. Those are strong, centuries-long scripts in our nation. Am I right? We need to see them and, um, and um, interrupt them. So yeah, so um, that's where I'm putting that in context. Um, so there's a script, um, a sociological phenomenon called horizontal violence. Most, a lot of people talk about this lateral violence, but then they don't talk about, it is always in the presence of vertical violence. So we have this hierarchy of values of peoples. And you know, the black, brown, native people are down here. The gender queer folks are down here. Poor folks are down here, right? And we, horizontal violence is when we end up fighting against each other instead of understanding we're part of a system that sets us at each other. Hello? So that black and brown people are more likely to take out frustration over inequality on each other instead of uh, someone teaching us um, what's, what's the system that maintains us both down at the bottom of society structure. Y'all feel me? So we have brown on brown crime, black on black crime, protests where we destroy our own neighborhoods, uh, nurse on nurse bullying. There's definitely doctor on doctor bullying, physician on physician bullying, uh, mean girls, right? A lot of people would say you're just, if you're concentrating on this without looking at what's the system that sets women against each other? What's the patriarchy that sets women against each other? And then black, I said black on, but what, what I really meant was black on brown and brown on black crime. Do y'all feel me that that's a, that's a script? If, if we see that, like if folks in Chicago, I feel like could see why are we killing each other? What is it we need from society? Is that person really, the person you wanna be hurting. There's a Mexican American author, Luis Rodriguez, who is from Los Angeles. He wrote this book um, a couple decades ago, but still relevant. He talked about growing up as a Mexican American gang member. And to me, we share this script, y'all. He says, there's an aspect of suicide in young people whose options have been cut off. They stand on the street corners, flashing hand signs, inviting the bullets. It's either la torcida or death, a warrior's path, when even self-preservation is not at stake. If you think about the children who will be killed in Chicago this weekend alone, and if they murder, the victims are usually the ones who look like them, the ones closest to who they are, the mirror reflections. They murder and they're killing themselves over and over again. Everybody get that? sense of horizontal violence, so senseless, right? Out of a sense of systemic inequality and the frustration it brings. So it's like, so what's that script when Canela says, mom, the blacks don't like the Mexicans and the Mexicans don't like the black. What's that script? 
Where does it show up in history? How does it show up in my background, in my head and in my thoughts and in my actions? And who does that benefit? I wanna um, go, cause I don't, I didn't have as much time as I thought I would, even though I knew exactly how much time I would have. So I said, um, someone said, and I don't know who said this, do not expect those who benefit from your disadvantage to dismantle the system that advantages them. Do y'all feel me? Okay. And we could go back to this one, right? Do not expect folks who are benefiting from this <laughs> to dismantle it so you can have a better life. That's up to us as black and brown people and other disenfranchised folks to not let people divide us. Um, how does that happen? How do you interrupt those scripts? Dorica Blackman from Stanford says you got a double study. If you're just depending on what you think you know about the other person because you learned it in high school, you're gonna miss it, okay? Because we are set up to be against each other. So we are not paying attention to where the real struggle is. Um, in fact, um, there's so much solidarity between black and brown people. I could write a book. That's a joke for those of you who know me. Um, it's an inside joke. Um, still trying to write that book, <laughs> Therese. Um, so you Dr. got King, it. You got it. <laughs> Dr. King told Cesar Chavez at the beginning of the uh, great boycott, he said, our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. We should not let anybody separate us, y'all. Do y'all feel me? I just want to show, um, I want to, this is the last slide, but I, I want to tell you a story of, um, I was with uh, teaching medical students, not this last summer, but the summer before last. And one of the medical students, it was right after Mr. Floyd was killed. And she's a Mexican American um, Chicana um, who came to me and said, Dr. Jan, I'm, I'm horrified by what I'm reading on Instagram and Facebook about black people in the Latino community. The, the Latino, Spanish speaking Latino community was writing about black, black people, all the stereotypes, all the fear, all this stuff. So it's like, I, I just want to leave you with this example of how you can interrupt the script. If we know our history together, and if you haven't seen Y'all, if you haven't seen Cesar Chavez, the movie with Michael Pena, if you haven't seen the movie about Dolores Huerta, if you haven't seen Summer of Soul, we, we need to um, get out of our comfort zones and learn about how regal our histories are and actually how overlapping they are. Um, so from, from that, Maria and I uh, sat down with my son, uh, Gabriel, who's at the Berklee College of Music. He's a musician and a visual artist. And he put together this one, um, the first in what we hope is a series, a, um, an Instagram post. And I just want to show it to you as we um, come to a close here. Okay, let's see, Jan, what you got? Okay, media types. Okay, so this one's, it's in both Spanish and English. We had a lot of people helping us. Um, I'm just gonna show it here instead of trying to go to the whole screen. Here it is.
So I'm going to show it to you in Spanish so you believe me. And then that'll be the end. Just trying to be creative about how we can um, interrupt and rewrite the script. I don't know how many of you knew that the first Black president, uh, that Vicente Guerrero was Mexico's Obama and Mexico's Lincoln. There's a reason you don't know, y'all, because that would have been really helpful, right? Oops, sorry. Uh, do, 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 do. Y'all might have to believe me that it's in Spanish as well. So um, I'm going to give this to Aaron as soon as I figure out. I, I personally do not have an Instagram account. I don't know what that is. I'm still back on texting and WhatsApp and all that kind of stuff. Have made it off Facebook because I've never made it into Facebook. But it seemed like a good strategy, y'all. So um, Anyway, that's all I wanted to say is that we have so much in common. I'm so happy that the groups are getting together and helping one another out, building another uh, cord of um, solidarity that actually is part of our history. We just haven't been taught it, okay? Any, um, I'll end there, Aaron, and, and you can tell me if there's time for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jan. So, Full transparency, since I feel kind of guilty, you feel like you didn't have a lot of time. Um, no, really no, had... no, I didn't say that. I said, you gave me the amount of time I had. I just, no, that's not on you. Dude, that's if anyone's not... ever listened to Dr. Jan talk, I gave her an hour and she's like, no, I'll do 30 minutes. And I did that look like 30, 30 minutes. <laughs> you can't, you can't do like, that. You can't like, do that. Nah, that's not a thing. That's like going to Costco just for some milk. It's just oh. not a thing. <laughs> oh, did not just say that. Okay, okay. But we are honored to have you speak. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions or um, comments? I had the opportunity, like I said, having three quarters with Dr. Jan, and you could hear the same lecture about the same topic, and it would be completely different. Her slides are like one picture, and she has just like this full on discussion, and everyone's involved, and it's this is a great time. I just Thank learned you. So much. Thank you, Aaron. I'm so proud of y'all for getting these groups together in our in the Sacramento region. This is y'all changing the world for sure. Yeah, and hopefully we're gonna keep working together. So, um, on that note, um, I am gonna introduce uh, Miss Sandra, president of the uh, non chapter of Sacramento, to introduce our second keynote speaker. Go ahead, Sandra. All right. Dr. Murray Garcia, so amazing. I loved it. I want to share a quick little story. Um, when I started um, my preceptorship at the hospital, I went to University of Nevada, Reno. I went to St. Mary's Hospital. And I remember a, a CNA came up to me and I had my uniform on and was all nervous. And she, she said in Spanish, what are you doing here? And I said, uh, excuse me. She said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a nursing student. And she said, you are? I said, yeah. She's like, are you a real nurse or are you a, are you going to be a real nurse is what she's, what she said to me. And I was really taken back by that. And I said, um, I didn't know there was any other kind of nurses. You know, I said, I'm not a fake nurse. So I think what she, <laughs> what I think what she meant was, are you going to be like a CNA, right? Like she didn't believe that I was actually going to be a full on right. RN. So again, like you were talking about that horizontal violence, right? The scripts, that really resonated with me because it was like my first day and I was already being questioned as to what I was doing there. Your own people. Yeah, yeah. So um, thank you for that. That was that was great. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Regina Orozco. Um, Dr. Orozco is a nurse educator. She's been at the community college level for the last 14 years. Her background is in labor and delivery. She's been doing that for 17 years and she's st still doing that now as an educator um, uh, per diem. Again, she started nursing um, at the associate degree level, worked her way all the way up to PhD in nursing from the Betty Ivory Moore School of Nursing. Her primary focus has been on generalized nursing education and quality nursing education. So very excited to introduce Dr. Regina Orozco. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, let's see, let me share my screen with you. And they're so, I'm so not tech, te um, tech savvy either. It's one of those things for me. My kids always do it for me. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, okay, great. Um, all right, so I have been asked to come and talk with everyone today about, um, uh, I, actually it's a little bit about my dissertation that I just finished in 2020, but also just a little bit about the differences in um, educational levels through the educational pipeline for nursing. Um, and I really definitely have a passion for it. Um, when I was start, when I started out with my dissertation, I didn't know what direction I was going in. And Dr. Um, Ackerman Barger really helped me to like settle in and kind of like hone down. And as I started getting more and more into this, um, I started to realize that it, it really is such a mystery even to ourselves as nurses. Um, so if I can open that knowledge to everybody and, and let people make accurate decisions, then I think that's the best I can do right now to start, right? So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the nursing educational pipeline and um, how we can increase the um, equity in it by education. So understanding what each one of these levels truly means when we get in and, and, and where we're putting ourselves. So. so this is the actual nursing educational pathway itself. So there's different levels. You can start as an entry level by going in through the LVN route. Um, and then it moves all the way up through to DNP and PhD. So all of these levels are considered nursing and kind of like what Sandra just said, I appreciated hearing that because are you a real nurse? Well, anyone along this continuum is a real nurse. So it's not really like what, le what letters do you have after your name as much as are you in the nursing field and what are you here for, you know? So in that sense, we have to look at this this pathway and realize how do we enter in and how do we get to where we want to be and of course we know that we want more people to be the most educated we can get them but at the same time we shouldn't be putting labels on people who haven't gotten quite there yet for out of their own not even out of their own um own, own willingness not to try sometimes right as we'll see so anyway so as we look through this this pathway um, the DNP and PhD level is more on that research level, um, more on the clinical uh, aspects, and um, that's kind of the direction that that nurse um, educator or that nurse um, researcher will take when that time comes and they reach that particular level. They can do other things with it, but that's kind of where we, um, what you think about when you put a definition to those titles. Um, in the MSN level, um, you can do so many things in the MSN level, right? So it really starts to go and, and branch out to the advanced practice nurses. So you can become a certified nurse midwife, or you can um, decide that you want to be a clinical nurse specialist or a nurse educator like myself. So when you look at the MSN, there's many options um, that are very tailored specific. Leadership and management is another big one. Um, and that's kind of like uh, for uh, managers on the floor or um, those who want to go higher up in, in, the in the hospital system itself too. Um, and then there's the BSN level, which is the leadership um, aspect. So kind of the difference between the ADNs and the BSN um, is that they focus a little more on leadership. At least that's the curriculum definition of um, what the BSN level is. So those are all considered higher level education. So those are, those are actually achieved at your university levels, at your private colleges, but at a higher level than like the community college, for, for instance. So um, although the BSN is coming down to the, um, to the community college level, it's not quite there yet everywhere. So right now, currently, if you want your BSN, your MSN, or any of the higher levels, you have to go to a university to achieve that. Um, so when we look though at the higher degree for persons of color, we know that out of 100% of them, we can see that the BSN is the most obtained out of that. So 61.72% of the 100% will get a BSN for people of color. For an MSN that drops to 34.03, which is already half, 
Um, and then when we get to the DMP level, you can see it really drops down to only 3.66% of people of color out of 100% of higher degree reached. And then down to our PhD level, we're even less, which is only zero, sorry, I was like zero point something. I'm like trying to see it. <laughs> the picture is in the way, forgive me. Let me go back here. Um, okay, so 0.3%. So that is what we look at when we look at that picture for our higher level people of color who've achieved that status. This is kind of where our numbers start to drop off at. And these numbers, of course, need to be changed. As we know, that is not a question. Um, and I'm not here to question that. I'm just here to show you what your levels and what your options are. So, so from a percentage of people of color who graduate with this licensure, BSN, ADN, we'll notice that BSNs graduate at 20.5% for people of color and the ADN level, they graduate at 21.5%. So there's not a big difference in the number of people graduating that are people of color, there's not a big difference between those two levels of entry for um, licensure. But when I was doing my dissertation and my research, I started noticing that there was only 40.9%, that's a huge number, 40.9% enter at the LVN level for, for people of color. And that's a huge significant difference. Now, this is where they're licensed. That doesn't mean they don't move up the, the ladder or but when we look at actually entering, and we look at the numbers of those who are entering, we don't see these kind of numbers with other, with other sort of racial groups. So like our Asian group will definitely be on the higher end, closer to your BSN or MSN. They're moving into that um, from the beginning instead of starting at the lowest level and working their way up. And I was quite surprised when I was digging because I didn't really find a rationale for that difference between the 40.9 and the 21.5. It seemed as if it was almost hidden and really hard and challenging to find. So I decided to do some research and try and figure out, um, okay, what is the difference? Let's start with just generalization of definition. What's the difference between an LVN and an ADN? Because they both can be achieved at the community college level, like I've said before. So let's take a look even worse when we look at the numbers in California. This is actually more astonishing. So when we look at the numbers of licensed professionals in California who are white RNs, it's 52%. And when we shift over to black and Latinx combined, it's only 12% in California that are licensed. And then we look at our LVNs and it's 2% for white and 64% for our LVNs. So that's a huge difference, that's significant. And when we look at the population numbers, it really truly doesn't make sense. If we look at the population number of Latinx being 39% in California, why are only 7% becoming RNs, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And this was in 2017 when this data came out. So, and even more so, I can't even circle Native American because no data exists. So that also speaks volumes to us, right? That that, that piece is missing. Okay, so back to our, what's the difference? So we know for a licensed vocational nurse, they're gonna enter in at this entry level, you're responsible for the basic nursing care. You do have to pass an NCLEX exam. It is called a PN for, um, practical nursing exam, and you have to fulfill the state requirements the same way. You will practice under a physician or registered nurse, and the time it takes to get through the program is between 12 and 18 months. Some programs can be a little longer if they're part-time, some can be up to 24. For a registered nurse, this is a degree that you obtain, let me move you over a little bit, sorry, and you have to pass your RN exam, and then you have to fulfill your other state licensing requirements. Now, what's interesting, um, is that these exams are quite similar. I teach in both programs, actually. I teach in the LVN program and the RN program, and the licensures is very, the exams are very similar. The types of questions, the critical thinking behind them, they're very similar. Um, so an associate's degree is the minimum, though, for a registered nurse, whereas a vocational licensed nurse, you can get a certificate. Um, you don't necessarily have to get a degree. Um, it is a 24-month educational minimum at most places. Um, and some can be even a little bit longer dependent, um, especially if you go into your MSN or your BSN, 
um, they'll tack on an additional year. So it could be three, four years. Um, if you do direct entry programs, um, it may be as much as 18 months, and that is because usually summers are included. So technically, if you were to take the summer out, it would be 24 months like most of the programs already. So then I had to go to the prerequisites and say, okay, so what are the differences between the prereqs? And so for the LBNs, the main prereqs at most schools, now, for those of you who are wondering about educational purposes, you really have to dig into each school because there is no set succinct number of prerequisite courses. And if you're going to apply to like seven different colleges, you may have to complete seven or eight different types of prerequisites just to even apply. So unfortunately, um, and I will throw my bias in there, um, I think that that's uh, detrimental for the student who has to play this game of, oh, I need to take your nutrition, oh, I need to take your pharmacology, that pharmacology doesn't count. So from a main prerequisite um, standpoint for LVNs, A and P is required, but only a three unit combined course, which most colleges um, offer. Sometimes therefore like your paramedic programs, they'll be in there too, or, um, Psych techs will also be included in them. So they're not necessarily the teased out five unit A and P for each um, for your RN program. Um, so they are a little bit different. Pharmacology is three units, nutrition two to three units. So those are the main prerequisites that the BVM PT require for your LVNs to get licensed in California. And then your RNs, you have anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. Usually they are just like, they have to be sequential. So you'll have to take A, anatomy first, then physiology, then micro. Some places you're allowed to switch them up. Rarely are you allowed to actually take them all at the same time. So the difference between your prereqs actually can take a, a significant difference in time. So to take anatomy, you have to take chemistry and math usually at most colleges. Um, and then for your LVN program, you could take those all in one semester if you really wanted to like dig down deep and get them all done. Um, so that would only be what, six, seven, eight, and eight units, nine units at the most. So that can be done in one semester full time, whereas your other classes for the RN would take longer. So I could see why that difference could um, possibly exist, right? For those who think that they're gonna be getting through it faster, that might be something that is in their mind. Um, for the duties of an LVN, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but the point is, is that they're very basic nursing skills that even we'll see in a minute that the RNs also have. So collecting samples, educating patients, uh, recording personal information, vital signs, right? And passing meds, that's the big one, passing medications. And the RN responsibilities are very similar. I mean, you're performing exams, doing tests, collecting history, um, educating counseling. So where does the difference lie? So RNs can actually do IV medications, whereas LVNs cannot. LVNs can hang simple solutions like mainline, LR, things like that, but they can't actually do medications. Um, RNs can interpret the data, whereas LVNs can only collect it, supposedly. Um, that's by definition. Of course, they should use their critical thinking. Um, and then the last thing is that they are RNs are responsible for LVNs if they work in the same facility. So like a lot of the long-term care facilities where I do clinical, you'll notice that there's one RN working in the long-term care facility and there's like seven um, LVNs, or if you're lucky. And then they're the ones that are kind of watching over them um, and doing the IV meds if they need them and stuff like that. They get pulled and, and moved around. So not a big significant difference in the responsibilities between the two, really. So. So then I went to the location of LVN schools in California, and you'll notice that in the community college level, there's 48 in California for LVN schools um, that are actually out there that you can go and get your LVN degree or certificate. Um, and then for private schools, here's the significant difference. 80 schools exist for you to get your, your degree or your certificate for an LVN. So that equals 148. So it appears, and when I was looking at the numbers, 71% of LVNs actually go to private school. The private schools admit more frequently. They're there with the prereqs, like you can start them 
sequentially like, oh, you can start this one and in six weeks you can start this one and in six weeks you can start this one. So it feels like a very quick turnaround time. Um, so the sales pitch for our private schools are more like, you can come here, you can go ahead and uh, start working faster, you can start making money faster. Um, and even when I get to my own dissertation, um, I wanted to point out that one of the students even told me that they had come to their high school because she was at a low income high school on the border of Mexico and California. And they were uh, marketing to them to come and work there um, and get their degree for um, an LVN. So I thought that was fascinating um, that they actually came and tried to get them. There's a lot of research that talks about that so, to recruit. In California for the ADN schools, we have 89 total colleges and 12 private schools. So that equals 101 total. So there is a significant difference, right? We had 148 LVN schools and 101 ADN schools. And some of these private schools actually are not direct entry. So you already have to have your LVN to actually get into the ADN program. So that also can be a barrier for some people. And they say, well, let me get my LVN license first because then I can jump over to this private school and they can get me in um, into, that, into that program as an ADN. So I wanted to point out some of the LVN schools that are near Sacramento so that we can have some examples um, about what this looks like. Um, so this first, um, let me move my little screen here. Um, Xavier College is not super close. It is in, um, in um, Stockton, excuse me. Um, but they are one of the schools that um, do uh, market to uh, students for, hey, come over here, it's 12 months full time. It is $27,000 to go there and get your LVN license. Whereas Sacramento City College is three semesters full-time and it's only $4,000 to go. Carrington College, which is very close to the campus of um, UC Davis actually, um, they have a certificate program for the LVN program, which is $38,000 and the degree program is $46,000. So there's um, almost a, it's a $8,000 difference, almost $9,000 difference to get your degree um, through them for your LVN license. And then Unitech was listed close to Sacramento, but it didn't even have um, fees that they were um, requiring, so. Okay, now I must tell you too, while we look through these, that a lot of these schools are actually very challenging to get into as far as like the um, community colleges. So. In your mind, you're thinking, oh, $4,000, why wouldn't I do that compared to $48,000? But the $48,000, remember, they start every three, three times a year or, or two times a year, and they're very like, hey, come over here. We can help you get in faster and get money and start, and start working. So Sacramento City College is one of the ADN um, programs close to everyone there. Um, $5,860 was listed on their website as the um, total price to go there. American River College is another um, community college that's close. And then again, Xavier College. And the reason I pointed this one out, even though again, it's in Stockton, they were one of the only schools that I noted anywhere close to us that had a direct entry RN program. So you can do that without doing your LVN first. So you're saving yourself $40,000 um, essentially by going straight in and now you only have to spend 47 instead of 90 to get your RN license. So. so after all that information, I was still super unclear why, why would you choose to go into an LVN program over an RN program when both of them seem to have some sort of impaction, both of them seem to have their pros and cons, and I couldn't really find any literature on it. So, um, so we decided, Dr. Um, Ackerman Barger and I decided to, let's see what happens when I interview some of these um, women of color and see what they have to say. So um, 12 women of color were actually interviewed. They started as LVNs. And this, I have to tell you, this started, like I started collecting people to like try and interview the week that we went into COVID closed down. So it was lucky that I got 12 people. I was so happy that I even got 12. Um, when I started interviewing them, the criteria for um, actually being part of the study was not that you wanted to be an RN at some point, but it actually ended up that all of them wanted to be RNs, which I thought was kind of fascinating because they all wanted to be RNs, yet they started as LVN. So it was really good data collection in the sense of, hey, why did you go in that direction then instead? 
And four actual themes came out of it. One of them was intrinsic forces. So internally, right? One was economic necessity. Another was institutional marginalization. And the fourth theme that came out of it was social support. And so for the purposes of today's, um, for today's lecture, I wanted to actually just focus on economic necessities and institutional marginalization. But I will point out that under intrinsic factors, there could be a whole research study done on these women who felt like they weren't good enough. That was the main thing that I got out of it. I want to try and see if I can make it. I want to try and see if I can be successful. And it was actually really hurtful to even hear that kind of message because we all should be able to do what we need to do. Um, and the, the background should be there. So that was kind of harsh. Some people also um, uh, wanted for social support were saying, I had all the support I needed. I had my work friends, my other friends had done it. So I did it. Um, my family was supporting me. I could stay close to home and still be supported. So there were reasons that made some sense in those two factors, um, in those two categories that I was like, okay, I can see where that, where that came from. For economic necessity, um, three out of the 12 told me that they found a part-time program so they could still work and go to school. And I think that's huge. And it actually doesn't sound like a lot, but that's one third, right? Um, when I went digging for, hey, what schools are out there that are ADN programs that are part-time, I could only find one in California and it was in Southern California. So unless you wanna uproot your whole family and move there, um, you really could have to work full-time and still go to school full-time as well. So they, part-time program, I can go to school part-time and still continue to work and support my family. And I think that's important because I didn't have an answer for that when I was looking at this. Like, how do you tell somebody quit work? And unfortunately, even like where I go to school, where I teach school, we're like, sorry, try and cut your hours as low as possible. The next two years, you're, you know, ours, you have to. And that's really challenging for somebody who's like the sole breadwinner for their family. And we know that people of color are very economically disadvantaged in our culture and not from any fault of their own through schooling, through, through um, generational wealth that was not there for them. So many factors have played into, I'm the sole uh, provider or I'm one of the sole providers of the family, right? So that makes it challenging to even try and address that unless the school start to address, hey, we can have part-time programs. Instead, we're trying to force everybody through, right? Like we're short, we're short, we're short. Um, okay. And so then it felt as though um, I got a lot of them would make um, the comment that it felt as it was a faster way to make money. And I thought that was kind of fascinating when I started like tearing and teasing out those pieces because California LME on average make about 4,300 a month. So four of the five women in that um, uh, study actually went to a private college and had to take out student loans. And when I looked at Xavier College, they reported 92% of their students take out a federal loan to even go to school there. So with average student loan being $30,000, that's $400 a month for 12 years. So technically you're only making $3,900 a month because 400 of it is going back to repaying loans. So now maybe that is a better economic situation for some people, but I can say that talking to them, they found it hard to get out of that spiral because now they have to work to pay back the loan. And it was challenging for them to try and, and move along that educational pipeline, which was their dream to become an ADM. So. On the institutional marginalization side, there was quite a few subcategories. The two I'm gonna focus on, the first one being obstructive admission criteria. This is like classic historical ways to gatekeep and keep people of color out. And nursing was no different. So they, um, one of the things that was mentioned was this TEAS exam. And what happens is you have to go and take your science, math, and all these little pieces that measure, and I use quotes and measure, they measure um, what your skill level is um, in those particular areas. And then you have to score a particular score. And if you do, then you qualify to even apply to that particular college. Now that's not a guarantee you'll get in, but you at least qualify to get um, to apply. 
Um, one of the other um, obstructive admission criteria pieces was prerequisites expiring. So these students had taken their science courses and yet those science courses were about to expire. So they had to jump in and do the LVN program or they would have to start over again on their sciences, which were the um, anatomy, physiology, and micro. So interestingly enough, I told you the prereqs, right, were big difference in the amount of time, yet almost everyone I had talked to had done their prereqs for the ADN program, thinking they were going to get in. So now they found themselves like, oh, wait a minute, I'm scrambling because I'm going to lose these and I would have to start over, which is another year and a half of my life. So they took the LVN route so that those didn't expire, which I thought was a, a, a smart strategy in the sense of hey, at least I'm doing something versus just losing what I've already gotten. So for any of you who are thinking about doing this, make sure you take those science classes last so that there, you know, you do those ones that don't expire, like your English. And some people say, I'm going to get the hard ones out of the way first. But keep in mind that those may expire at that particular college you're going to. So you really want to be educated on what should be the, sequ the sequence of my courses that I'm taking. One of the other um, pieces was something called a composite score. And this is actually fascinating because um, the community college level is not allowed to actually, by law, community colleges are supposed to serve the public. So you can't use GPA as an admission criteria in the sense of, hey, here's your GPA. You don't qualify to come to school here, bye. But the nursing programs kind of found a way around that through something called the Chancellor score, um, the California Chancellor's Office handed down this research study that they did, and they said, here, if you meet these criteria for sciences and for um, English and math and GPA and you add them all together, if you get a specific score, then you qualify and you have, are more likely to be successful in nursing school. So a lot of the schools adopted this composite score as a, as a structure, not everyone's is the same. Again, every criteria is different everywhere you go. So make sure you pay really close attention to that. But one of the tricks I will throw out there for those of you who are trying to get in is if you had a death in the family and you were taking English or you had a, um, you know, you had to drop for childcare purposes and you had to like enter back in, any of the courses besides the science courses, you can actually look into what's called academic renewal for GPA and they can pull out some of those GPA um, scores and help you so that when they do this composite score, it doesn't hurt you. Now, they won't do that for your sciences, most of the places, um, and I'm using, again, that as a generalization, but a lot of places you can take them out for other things like a humanity class or something that um, was there that is hurting you. So. The other institutional marginalization piece that I found actually quite fascinating was this um, notion that it's easier to go from an LVN to an RN. So there's this rumor out there that once you get your LVN license, you can apply to an RN program easier and get in. So there's only about 45 LVN to RN options, though, in California. So if we look at the numbers, that really doesn't make sense from a number perspective, especially when there's 125 options for registered nursing entry level options. That includes DSN, uh, Masters, and ADN. So it doesn't quite equal out with the numbers. Um, and out of those 45 LVN to RN options, you may have already taken, like I said, your LVN at a private college, and now you're at Carrington and spending another $40,000. Or you go to Los Medanos thinking, oh, I'll just pay $4,500. And what I found out is that Los Medanos only admits six students in 2020. So you thought you were going to be part of this cohort of 40, but reality is you were one of six that were going to get in. So that kind of limited to 44 options, in my opinion, because out of six, you're probably not going to be one of those that get in when there's so many people who are believing this number that LVN to RN is easier to get in. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do LVN to RN. What I'm saying is that you really have to think, is this what's right for me? So there really is no right way to get in. It would be nice if we had all these gatekeeping pieces taken out. And instead of saying, sorry, you don't qualify, go find another job. We said, sorry, you're not really meeting the criteria for English. Let's get you where you need to be. But currently, that's not the status of our educational system. 
And so you need to find what works for you. There's not my way, there's your way. I started as an ADN. I was not luxury enough to just get into a BSN program. My grades were horrible. I had young children. I was a teen mom. I could not just jump in. So I needed to find what worked for me and the associate degree level worked for me. So just keep this pathway in mind. You can jump in at any point. You can start at the bottom and work your way up, but you truly, truly, truly have to understand what each level requires, what expires, what doesn't, what are my odds of getting in, and don't just say, oh, I heard from so-and-so, I've heard. And the counseling system, I am not trying to be disrespectful, but you need to speak to somebody who's a nursing counselor, not just somebody who is a generalized counselor, because they may not understand all of the ins and outs of nursing. And I would say also to talk to other people, speak to other people who have, who've done it, who have gone and walked this route, and that have done it recently. So they have a little more like, oh yeah, I know, or that work in the field and can say, yes, um, I'm an educator. I know a little bit more about this process. Um, I've had students come to me and say, oh, I'm gonna be a psych tech and then I'm gonna jump over into the RN program. And I said, well, there's actually not an, a PT to um, RN program. There's an LVN to RN programs, but there's no such thing as PT. And they're like, oh, I heard there was. So make sure you know what's out there and what, what's right for you. And regardless of which entryway you go, there are required skills along the way. And if you think that this list sounds like you, yes, I'm great at multitasking, I can work well under pressure. And as long as you think that these skills are something that you possess or that you can learn, then nursing is the right field for you. You just have to figure out how to get in. That's it, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Orozco. Um, are there any questions? I, I kind of really related to that T's test thing. I, I remember applying for school and not really knowing anything about the T's test. And my program was like, oh, you get in you know, next semester, you just have to take your T's test. And so I sign up and I march down to Sac State and I'm like walking in to take my T's test and everyone's sitting with books. And I'm like, what is that? And they were like, we're studying. And I was like, there's a study guide. Like I had no idea there was a study guide, you know? And, you know, I remember looking at the, the test and they're like, you know, it's basic things, millimeters, centimeters, things like that. But <laughs> I'm not good at that. I can, me I can measure out fluids, you know, college and teach you a lot about you know, leaders, you know, there's the handle, there's a tall boy, those kind of things is what you learn, you know, in college, but I didn't really know much about <laughs> measurements there. Um, but I had the opportunity to work at a skilled nursing facility for a short period of time as a new grad. And, and I, I remember walking in there and going, wow, this is where all the minorities are. You know, I didn't see any uh, representation when I was uh, uh, working in the RN, when I was in the RN program. So thank you so much. Um, thank you will, for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we will now uh, move on with our um, with uh, the national president, Dr. Martha Dawson, who will be delivering uh, closing remarks. She is an associate dean at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Birmingham School of Nursing and the 13th president of the National Black Nurses Association. She earned her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Alabama School of Nursing. In 2010, she earned a doctorate in nursing practice from Case Western Reserve University uh, Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. She completed her hospital, um, completed her hospital administration residency at Gaston um, Memorial Hospital in North Carolina. Dr. Dawson is the co-convener uh, of the 2020 National Black Coalition Against COVID and a co-lead on the 2020 National Commission on Racism and Nursing. She served as a senior level positions as Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Operations, Chief Nursing Officer, Associate um, Chief Nursing and Operating Office, and other leadership roles. She is nationally and internationally recognized as a global thought leader in the fields of nursing, healthcare system, or health systems administration, nursing education, and translational research. 
Dr. Dawson is devoted to de developing and mentoring the next generation of healthcare leaders and increasing diversity in nursing. She is a fellow in many organizations and has won many awards. I had the opportunity of meeting Dr. Dawson in 2019, back when we were shaking hands with other people during her inauguration in New Orleans. Both the Capital City Black Nurses Association and the Sacramento chapter of NON are honored to have Dr. Dawson deliver closing remarks for what has, I hope has been a rewarding conference. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. And it has been a wonderful, great conference. And I'm just trying to figure out what you want me to do here at the end. It's been so great. <laughs> but, and, and, and I really just enjoyed every speaker. And as I was just listening to everyone and take note, so many things that they talked about did resonate with me. And one of the things that really, I think, caught my attention is that what we're talking about really is change. And sometimes we as nurses, we're not comfortable with change. And that's what we need to do. Uh, so I'm going to give you all a call to action and say that we all have to lean into where we are today in this space uh, because this is groundbreaking for us as a profession. Uh, I've been a nurse for 44 years, uh, and this is the first time I've seen a report that have come out, which is the 2020 to 2030 uh, nursing report uh, that was just put out, future nursing report put out by the Academy uh, of Medicine. And they actually were brave enough to delay publishing that report and in the end, they actually use racism 94 times. During my entire schooling and education, I've never seen racism published as it relates to the profession of nursing, not even once. So I feel as if we have a door that is open. So the question is, what are we gonna do with the door? Are we going to lock? Are we just gonna unlock it, but leave it closed? Or are we ready to lean in and open it? And if they don't allow us to open it, kick it down. Because we have to change the, uh, the footprint here. At this time, there's 4 million nurses in the uh, RNs, registered nurses in the United States. And out of that, um, out of that particular 4 million, barely over 1 million are nurses of color. And when I say nurses of color, I mean, whether we're talking black and African-American, Hispanics, Asian, uh, Native American, Filipinos, all of that, that entire group there, when you're looking at just the RN population, and we're still here with such a small, a small group, that means that it's time for change. We need change in practice. We need change in academia. Let me flip the script here. First, we need change in academia because that, they are the gatekeeper, okay? And I, and I know for myself that we almost have stopped teaching in academia. We're almost expecting the students to come there ready to do nothing but make A's and go out, come in the front door and go out the back door. I don't know what's going on with the faculty. Oh, and by the way, thank you for giving me a raise. I let my dean know that now I'm a dean or something, okay? Because I'm on an associate professor. <laughs> because I enter academia during the end of my career. I've only been doing this for 13 years uh, on a full-time basis. But to get back to where I am here, we got to go education because that's, that's the entry level into practice. So if we don't increase the number of individuals coming in that front part of the pipeline, then we're not gonna get anything at the end of the pipeline. And there are some barriers within education that we need to undo. I'll give you an example of a couple of the ones I think we need to undo. The admission criteria that you all just described about having to take a test just to get into a nursing program totally necessary, okay? If it wasn't necessary for me back in 1976, it's not necessary today, okay? Uh, another thing that isn't uh, necessary, it, it is not necessary for us to say that if a student fail one course, 
And then if they fail a second course, they're out of the program. And I don't know about your state, but in my state, if you fail out of one program, you got to almost sit out another year before you can go to another program. And if you fail two courses in the same semester, you're still kicked out. And I'm going to be very clear about something. Nursing is the cash cow on for every university and every college that it sits on. I don't care if it's one of your top 10. I don't care whether it's just one of your four-year schools that are not connected to a university. If you're talking about your ADN program, we are the cash cows, OK? We're the ones bringing in the money. Part of the reason we're bringing in the money, though, is because we keep failing people and people keep heading back and they get delayed and on and on. And just like someone was saying, by the time they finish, they are in so much debt, you know, then they can't continue to progress in their careers. So we have to call these things. We have to talk about them and we have to be very about what we are saying. And, and the fact is, we need to change academia, then we need to change practice, okay? We need to stop with this excuse that our black and brown nurses cannot go into ICUs, the ER, the, and the other specialty areas. And we need to stop in practice where we keep training everyone that comes through the door and everyone else become the charge nurse, the head nurse, and the and move on and on up the change. But yet still, you're the one who keep doing the preceptorship when they first enter in the door. You know, I had someone ask me one time, said, uh, uh, one presentation that I did, and someone said, so Martha, what can we do to change this? I'm saying, if you walk through it with your eyes open in your university, you're going to see the same thing that I see. And what have happened during this pandemic? Those same nurses that they said couldn't work in the ICUs, when they turned the med service units into COVID, who was taking care of those patients on the ventilators and everything else? Without training. Now, I know somebody's going to say, oh, but we trained our nurses. If you gave them two or three weeks of training, that wasn't much for somebody who you said could not work in the ICU when your typical ICU orientation is almost seven, eight, or nine weeks. Okay, I'm just calling it as I see it. I don't know. You told me just bring up the end. So I'm just I'm just putting some things out there for all to think about. That's all I want to do. I just want you all to think about. And my student colleagues, this is what you have to do. Learn to support each other. Don't worry about who's looking at you because the blacks are hanging the browns are hanging together and, and, and the colored people. Don't worry about that. Learn how to become peer-to-peer -peer supporters and mentors. And then also find those, those, those kindred souls once you get into practice who can begin to mentor you and also sponsor you and encourage you. And if that mentor is not uplifting you, because mentorship is not about me. I'm the mentor. It shouldn't be about me. It should be about you. I should be helping you to grow, help grooming you for that next level helping you to increase and sharpen your skill set. Not doing that, go find you another mentor, okay? And then you want that mentor to eventually flip and become your sponsor. Now, someone asking, what's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? The mentor is early in your career, helping you to get those skills uh, sharpened so that you can be the best clinical nurse that you can be. That sponsor is that person that is already kind of in a senior level position and they're ready to elevate you and help you get in front of crucial individuals that can help promote your career. So when I'm sponsoring you, I'm making sure you're getting in front of the right people. I'm giving you the right type of projects. I'm bringing you along when I'm going to speak somewhere at a conference. You know, I'm bringing you in to help me with my research just so you can figure out what this is like. I'm helping you to build your resume for that next progression. So you can move from the BSN to the uh, masters or, you know, we got so many different things. So now I can't hardly keep up with the uh, DMP or the PhD. And then now we got people going back who got a PhD and a DMP and the ones got the DMP getting the PhDs. Like I said, we're the cash cows people. We're keeping them in business. So we want to belong. 
but we're not going to beg to be at the table. Right now, it's, it's, it's a hot topic to want to be with the black and brown individuals and everybody want to talk about the social of health. And I have my own ideas about that. It's good to a certain extent, okay? But don't use me because it's hot right now and everybody's throwing out some grant money and other things. No, no, don't do that. Uh, and again, don't ask me to come in on the tail end of the grant to be just a matter expert. I will be the PI, okay? So that is, if I'm a faculty person, I can get part of my salary paid as well. Uh, like I told y'all, I've been a nurse for 44 years, so I just kind of go off, okay? The other thing we have to become is good advocacy. We got to advocate for what we want. We have to have a voice and lift that voice up. We have to get into there and start doing some of our own research. And then after we do the research, we got to be the one to also present the research and to validate the research. And then guess what? We don't always have to come up with new research. We need to be validating some of this research that is out there to make sure that is right and is aligned with our races and ethnicities, okay? Uh, someone mentioned about, uh, about pain earlier. Yeah, they've been saying that for years that, you know, black people got, we don't feel pain the way others feel pain, you know? And what did that lead to? a lot of mistreatment when it came down to during research with African-American females. You know, most of the uh, OBGYN procedures that was developed in this country was used by uh, using African-Americans and they wouldn't give them pain medication. You know, so it's not just the Tuskegee syphilis study, there's others out there, you know. And the same thing with our Native Americans when they decided they were gonna sterilize so many of their females. Those generation and generation of women that could not have future generations. So again, we have to talk about the history, understand it, but then we have to move forward as well. Keep us moving. Uh, the, the, a couple of other things I wanna just mention to you all as well. And, and that is, is that I want us to understand we have got to move from trying to say, let's talk to our kids in high school and junior high school about nursing we have to go to the, uh, to the elementary schools, okay? Uh, at this time, the National Black Nursing Association, we're getting ready to put together a curriculum for anatomy. And our goal is we will start this at least by the first of, uh, I, I say January, 2020. Uh, we're already working on that. We're gonna go into the elementary schools. We've already pilot tested that, where we've been into elementary schools. And it's surprising what these kids can learn. You know, when I'm talking to a, a third grader and, and I'm saying to them, well, you have to take a pharmaceutical course. What does that sound like? Sound like the drugstore, sound like the pharmacist. I would have never known that in the third grade. So our kids are smart enough to do this. And I refuse for someone to tell me that they can't. And part of that is because Again, one of our earlier speakers spoke about how much nurses can earn. People, this is an echo area, first of all, okay? Even before it become an educational barrier. A child educated is a family elevated. So if they don't educate me, I can't get elevated. And so this thing about I can't learn, I know you can because I can, I was younger, I was pronouncing cigarette as rigory because I had a speech impediment. I had to practice really hard and I get to talking too fast today. I'm gonna to mispronounce a lot of things, but guess what? I'm still, I'm an intelligent person and I know that I am. So I want to encourage you all to step out, take this information with you, but don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the other thing. Find someone in your nursing organization who will you know, most of the black nursing organization, we have mentorship programs where our nurses uh, members at the local level, they would mentor students to help students get through the nursing program. And I can't tell you how many students that have said to me, I didn't even know that, you know, I could even ask for help. I'm going, of course you can. You know, so again, um, when we look at our faculty, we know that it's not that many of us that look the same in these nursing programs. 
And, and someone mentioned about uh, someone saying that it was like the LBNs in the, um, in the ADs were what was coming to, to the schools in our communities. Yes, I've heard that happens here as well. You know, uh, I've had students that say, we don't see anyone except for the community colleges coming in, you know. And, and I tell my story. I said, you know what? I wanted to go to a historical black college and I, my, my mother could not afford to put me through that. My father had passed when I was young. I went to the junior college and as soon as I stepped through the door, I told them, I wanna be here for two years and transfer. I just wanna get my, my prerequisite out, then I want to move on. Now, thank goodness, I did have a Caucasian advisor and she listened to me and she got me hooked up, moving on. So while I'm telling this story, you have to find your own voice sometime and don't be afraid. My mother, one of her favorite saying was, if you don't have it and you ask for it and you don't get it, did you lose anything? Absolutely not, because you never had it. So take that little pearl of wisdom with you, okay? And the other thing that I would take with you is don't feel that you have to ask permission to be great. You're great all by yourself. And to me, you can give anyone a run for their money. Because another one of my saying is this, is if someone give me a rope and tell me to hang myself, once I have the rope, I have the power. And I can do what I want to with that rope, okay? But the last thing I'm going to do is hang myself with it. I may put it around my neck and swing to a tree, but I'm with it. So again, just know that it's okay for you to, and don't put all these limits on yourself. You know, people say, oh, I just got to get all A's. No, you have to be able to pass the NCLEX. If you can get through with some C's and some B's and you pass the NCLEX, go on and do that. And yes, and I know that's why we got to start with academia first, because they're going to say, well, you don't have a high enough a GPA to come back and get your master's degree. Again, these letters that we assign doesn't dictate your intelligence. So we have to break down some of those barriers as well. You know, Because I will tell you, when I was in undergrad school, I wasn't even thinking about the GPA. I had my little, my little thing down pat. I was studying hard at the beginning of the semester and I wanted to go into my final saying, hey, listen, even if I made a flat out F like a 45, I'm gonna still get a C out the course, you know. <laughs> and depending on what time of year it was, I might have decided to just go on out and have a little fun, you know, and then go get that C out that course. <laughs> Cause I wasn't thinking about, hey, listen, I need to have this GPA to get into grad school. I just thought I need to be able to get into grad school. And if I pass, I pass, that was it. So I've said enough and I'm gonna see if anyone have a few questions for me, uh, but resiliency is what I want you to take with you. Every student that hear my voice, you got this and you can do it. If you need a pep talk, hey, just look me up, I'll talk to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawson. It looks like there was one question from Susan Engel. She said, is there a model program that we could look at? And I believe she's referring to a nursing program when you were, saying, when you were speaking about programs earlier. You know, it is so hard because we have, like I said, we have so many different programs, just like the last one of the uh, prior speakers said, Regina said, I think it was, who was talking about all of the different programs that we have out there and the different pathways that you can get in. What you can do, though, is begin to think where you want to go. And, and this is another one of my pearls. It, it, and y'all, you all probably heard this many, many times. And I love to say it is not. It's not where you where you start. It's the road you take to get there, okay? And you can navigate that landscape once you get started, you know? And that's the other thing I would love for you all to do is encourage those people with those second degrees to come and look at nursing. Because right now, according to the World Health Organization, before the pandemic, they were saying we was gonna six million nurses in the world. Now, since the pandemic, they've already seen we need to add another million to that. So again, this is going to be wide open as an opportunity. So tell some of your second degree relatives 
And I think every nurse should commit themselves recruiting at least one nurse every year or one person every year to come into nursing. So I would just say kind of look at your schools, line them up, do it like I do when I'm trying to make a decision. Just say good, you know, create your little chart there, put the name of the school, good. What what is the cost? What is the value? And find out. Go out there and look up on uh on your web what percentage of their students are passing the in class. That's a big benchmark. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any more questions? Oops. A little bit of echo. No? All right, well, thank you so much for delivering those closing remarks. Um, I, I, I always say that. I love, I love when you said that. I heard it um, a couple months when you said a, uh, a person educated is a family elevated, and that's definitely true. And that's one of the things I talk to a lot of students when I meet them and they're struggling in schools and they're going through their blues you know, um, is just to keep at it. Like you will literally change the trajectory of your family, your kids, mm -hmm. everyone, right? Your parents, um, everything will change um, if you can mm -hmm. get to school. And I also tell people who are thinking about going into nursing school or just about to enter nursing school and want to know what it's like. I said, well, you're going to get, you're really going to get a lot of experience with failing, but <laughs> you'll get through it. You know, you just got to take your wins when you can get them, right? Um, and for a lot of people, like you said, who focus on these A's all the time, that's the most difficult part of the program is not always getting an A now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I hope you all enjoyed this conference. Um, I just want to thank everyone, all the panelists, the moderators, the, our um, presenters, our keynote speakers, our um, um, Dr. Nava, who is the president of uh, NON for delivering uh, the opening remarks. And of course, Dr. Dawson, who just finished with the closing remarks. Um, we were going to give a special shout out to our sponsors, um, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, um, the Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and UC Davis Health. I also want to thank uh, MBNA and NON for the work they are doing to create future nurses. All this is possible through the leaders that you've worked to create in these different communities um, around the country. Um, I could pass it over to Sandra if you had any words, any closing words, Ms. Sandra. Um, first, Dr. Dawson, amazing. Uh, so inspirational. I love everything you said. Um, very powerful. Um, and again, I just want to thank everyone who participated. Like I said, Aaron, Black Nurse Association, non, our members, uh, panelists. Um, it's just been so inspirational. I just love it. I feel like this really gave me another push to keep doing what we're doing, right? So this is this was amazing, and I appreciate your time. I um, just so moved. I, I I appreciate everything you guys did. Thank you. And before we uh, we exit, I would just like to recognize Sandra, who is going to be going into the PhD program. Um, I know Thank she didn't you. want to Thanks. her own horn, but she is doing amazing work. And so we're all gonna keep pushing. So thank you so much for spending the, the morning and the uh, early afternoon with me. Um, and please, please complete those surveys for us so we could continue to provide these uh, programming for our students, our future nurses that are out there. Um, if you have any questions, you could reach out to either one of our organizations. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, you could look me up. Like you said, Dr. Dawson, she's already ready for a conversation if you need a pep talk. So just reach out. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.